We've just had a presidential election. Barack Obama has been elected as the first black president of the United States. Just before he was elected, he came to Berlin. I was there at the Brandenburg Gate when he made his speech. I purposely carried a poster which outlined the prison population inside the United States. There are presently 2.4 million human beings in the prisons of America. Over 95% of the prisoners are black and Latinos. There are only 80,000 people incarcerated here in Germany. In America, 40,000 black women are in prison. That is half of the total prison population of Germany. I'd like you to comment on this situation and what we can do about it. Well, first and foremost, it um, reflects the ongoing systemic nature of racism uh, that American democracy, despite uh, virtues that have been achieved by people struggling uh, since the founding of that republic, there still is a baseline of a racialized socioeconomic system when we've got the largest prison population uh, in the world. The only other explanation for that would be that somehow we are biologically deficient and prone to criminality. And while every society produces criminals, uh, at the level of scale uh, and the systematic way that it is reflected in the incarceration of not only black men and increasingly black women, but brown men and increasingly brown women, uh, shows that we still have a fundamental challenge of systemic racism. We're here talking about interdependence. How do we address this problem, and how do we help them? Well, the, the, the first part is um, to assess how we got into this situation in the first place. And what it really requires um, is an undoing of an unjust law that that same Barack Obama, who you referenced earlier as a candidate, said he would address once he was elected president. We will see if they follow through on that. We will see if Eric Holder, who's I think a pretty good star as Attorney General, follows through on it. But the primary reason those black men are incarcerated is because of the crime bill that was signed under Bill Clinton um, that we now infamously know um, established um, that 100 to 1 crack to powder cocaine uh, discrepancy. So that you have to get caught with 100 times more powder than crack cocaine to get the same sentence, 100 times more powder than crack cocaine. Um, many of us took the saying during that during that debate um, as a slogan to get a point to get a point across very quickly. Crack is used in the streets, cocaine is used in the streets, uh, and so they started targeting obviously brothers in the streets. Uh, and so the, the 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 primary reason for the overabundance of black men incarcerated is because of that unjust law, that racist law. Uh, that cracked the powder cocaine discrepancy that, again, that Bill Clinton, for all that he did do for black people, he was horrible on that particular issue with all due respect. And so, um, the answer to your question, what to do about it, is to change the law, number one, because um, it's, it's wrong and it's, it's unjust and it's racist. But secondly, um, beyond changing the law, and this is, this is moving now beyond the, the realm of black men, which is part of the African American tradition. Uh, we fight, push down doors, um, make the country better not just for ourselves, but for everybody. So it's part of our tradition of making America a better place as the conscience of the country. Um, when we change those unjust laws, that doesn't just help black men. It helps all of America because it cuts down the amount of money we're wasting, quite frankly, on this prison industrial complex to warehouse African American men who have drug issues. Finally, um, I think the issue that we're talking about here has to first and foremost be seen as an issue of health not an issue of criminality to the point that James made earlier. There's nothing that makes black men more criminal. Every society produces criminals, but there is something criminal about a country that looks at a crisis like this first and foremost as an opportunity to lock people up when they have a health problem they need help with, particularly for those who are users. So anyway, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's a matter of undoing the laws and, and revisiting how we uh, attend to this issue of drug use in the first place. I think for me the basic issue has to do with values and priorities that uh, um, government officials, the uh, most powerful persons in American society, put very low value on the lives of poor people and especially black, brown, and red people. There's a low priority when it comes to the well-being for poor people, disproportionately black, brown, and red. And so you end up with high levels of unemployment, disgraceful school systems, 
dilapidated housing and a prison industrial complex that welcomes them mediated with the racist criminal justice system. And it results in high levels of incarceration, the passing of bills under Bill Clinton. We could go on and on and on. You know, when I was a young boy, my father always emphasized the importance of a good education. He would say, boy, if you don't get a good education, you'll end up digging ditches or picking cotton. Sadly, in reality, that was exactly the situation for most blacks in the South. There's a person who wrote a book about the end of slavery in America, and he maintains that slavery endured up until at least 1939. In the South, there were vagrant laws which helped to imprison blacks who were unemployed or homeless. They ended up on chain gangs. How much progress have we made? Well, chain gangs, I grew up doing the era of chain gangs, and, and I saw them. Um, I saw them frequently in small rural areas, uh, black men in chains, cutting grass on the side of the road. And there is the history of um, imprisoning uh, the dispossessed, the marginalized, the desperate, whether they had committed crimes or not, uh, to put them into private production, uh, to take care of the public space, uh, but not for the black public. Uh, so there's, there's, there's been that ex exploitative relationship. There is uh, one state in the southern part of the United States just in the last five, six years ago where chain gangs have been reinstituted, uh, which is a sign of inhumanity and brutality. It's not to say that someone who may be on a chain gang in 2000. Uh, nine has not committed a criminal act for which she or he should pay a public penalty, uh, but to put someone in the, the, in the, in, on a chain gang is a really a way of um, dehumanizing them and as a way of terrorizing uh, the rest of society to see this is what we can do with, with official violence. Um, a bigger problem, though, of the people who have health problems, I think Tavis is absolutely right, the United States is one of the biggest drug-consuming markets in the entire world, and of course uh, its largest consumption group is uh, not black and brown people, because that's not where the high-level drugs go. Uh, the people who are able to cosmetize, uh, put on a $1,500 suit, uh, a $700 tie, uh, go to a glass building and take a break now and then to do the cocaine and heroin or whatever they're doing, are, are not the people that we are really no. with. But the warehousing, putting people there uh, and not giving them any educational rehabilitation tools uh, is also a sense of a drop back in our humanity, uh, even as that we've made some, some advances in our society. Why isn't there an outcry against this travesty of justice? Well, it's, it's the point that Dr. West uh, raised earlier. There's a lack of value placed on the lives of black men and black women, on the bodies of black men and black women, on the humanity of black men and black women. Secondly, um, there is this conversation that does exist in certain parts of black America. I don't want to suggest that there aren't people in our community who, are concer who aren't concerned about these issues. Uh, Dr. West, for example, I know has spent uh, you know, 27 years, almost 30 years, teaching, not just at Harvard and Princeton and at Yale, but in the prisons. He's constantly in the prison system working with these young men. Harry Belafonte. Harry, Harry, Harry Belafonte, Danny Glover. There, there, there are a bunch of folks who we know who, who, who've done this kind of work. Um, so I don't want to suggest that, we, that the conversation isn't, isn't happening. The third and final point, though, on this for me is that when President Obama, candidate Obama, Senator Obama, again, was running for the White House, there were some of us trying to raise these issues then, trying to get these things on his agenda, trying to get him on the record speaking about these issues so that there'd be a record to hold him accountable to once he got in office. And while there are people in the community who are concerned about these issues, who've been victimized by these issues, most of us know somebody in our family or uh, family adjacent who is incarcerated even as we speak. Uh, there was this sense in black America that we didn't want to raise these kinds of Afrocentric, these black issues during the campaign that might hurt him from getting elected. And so as it turns out, um, we um, tried to raise these issues, didn't want to get addressed then. Hopefully as his, in his tenure as president we can address some of these issues now. What effect will this have on our families, on society as a whole? It demobilizes the entire nation. 
Uh, and to the extent that the United States has virtues, and there are a lot of virtues in the United States, uh, that is why we are under the gaze of the entire world with great expectations and with great frustration. It helps, uh, it contributes to demobilizing the human spirit and the expression of creativity. Uh, and the outcome uh, of resolving this is that we, the people, have to take seriously that we are the demos. We are democracy, um, and that our politicians and our markets are there to serve our interests, not for us to be the objects of their uh, orchestration. And so that all of our citizens have got it wrong, and um, our black and brown and women and young girl citizens are where the worst indices of the lack of democracy is. That is, they have voice. We don't have to give them voice, but we don't want to put an amplifier there. You know, they have visibility. They know one another, but we don't want to put a microscope there. Mm. Okay, we gotta go. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good, good.